Yes, my name is Ed Bennett and I'm an SATC tech chat. Wait, no, that's not what that slide means. <laughs> yes, yeah, so thank you all for coming. My name is Ed Bennett. I'm a research software engineer here at the Swansea Academy of Advanced Computing. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about staying sane in Python with virtual environments. So to start off, why do, why do we need virtual environments in Python? Why? But what's the problem? Why am I going to go insane if I don't use them? So the point is that in Python, we really like packages. And it's pointed out by XKCD back, in, back when XKCD was in the 300s and Python didn't need brackets or um, parentheses around calls to print. So you can, you can date that, comment, uh, that comic from that. But um, Python has this massive array of thousands and thousands of packages that you can download from PyPy, Pi Pi, formerly known as the cheese shop. Um, and so there's, there's these thousands of packages. And for, for various projects, you'll want to have maybe a dozen of them, maybe more. And that dozen will not be the same from project to project. So as you start, if you, if you just install them into your system environment, then you'll end up with hundreds and hundreds of packages installed. And then you'll have problems where two different packages conflict with one another or require, have different version requirements. Or um, also, when, when it comes to distribute your project to someone else, then you have a problem where you, you now need to identify exactly which packages you need. And then it becomes a trial and error process of, OK, let's try these packages, move to another machine, install them. Nope, nope, doesn't run, need this package, OK. And then you have, you might end up needing to write a long document of saying exactly what you need to install in what order in order to get your software working. And that's what we want to get away from. We want to try and automate this process and make it less insanity inducing. So we want to impose some kind of structure on this. And so the, the first way of doing this and the most basic is virtual env. Virtual env is a package. It's a third party package. It's available on pip. And we just say, we use the virtual env command. We give it an environment name that creates a directory with that name. It gives it um, some folder structure inside, including your usual bin and lib folders. So, and then in the bin folder, it puts a copy of your Python executable and then pip, wheel, set up utils, and so on. And then as you install packages, um, it installs them within that directory. And so what you'll normally do, you'll keep this virtual env directory inside your project so that then it is all tied together in one place. And then you don't version control that, but what you can do instead um, is export a requirements list that I'll come to in a bit. So we activate our virtual env using source, then this activate command that's within the environment, and it, it tells you in your shell that you've got it active, and then you can deactivate it again with deactivate. So just to do a quick example of this. Sorry, so this is the reason they didn't do that, is that then... Anyway, sorry. So yeah, I create, I create a virtual env, and it creates it, it's added, set up tools, pick, and wheel, and it's done. So now I can source and then activate. And now it gives me this end text on the left to say that I'm within this virtual environment. And so I can. If... Question? Yes. Sorry. Uh, it says that it also creates the executable Python. Is that just a same link to Python 3? Because I guess you don't have Python on this system. Let's have a look. Um... So we have, yeah, Python and Python 3.6, both symlink to Python 3, okay. which is an executable that has been copied in. Okay. So, oh. yeah, vir virtual, virtual env does copy in an executable. Oh, so it doesn't symlink to the system Python? No. Okay. Why does it take a copy of Python 3? I'm it's just an initialization, I guess, because you could... You might want to use a different version of Python. So it doesn't it doesn't manage Python versions as far as I know. Um, this is this is a different. So on the next slide, I'll, I'll come to a difference with virtual env and venv. But I'm not sure why they've made this design choice. Is it potentially so that the env environment is 
is completely so, portable. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, then you can change it onto the system. Yeah. Because, for example, I, I could create this environment at 3.1, and then I could roll my system path through Python 3 forward by four versions. And, yeah, uh, you're completely removing your dependence on system Python at that point. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. <coughs> but yeah, I, I, I can now pip install stuff. Um, so I can, I can pip install fish. It collects fish, it installs fish. So now I can. I can start Python, it runs Python 3.6.3, which it didn't before, and then I can input. Ah, fish is, fish is only for Python 2, that's annoying. I'll come back to that example. So, but now I, I, I can deactivate. I, I run Python 3, import fish, fish isn't there. So the <coughs> Uh, module is entirely con self con is entirely contained within the virtual env. As soon as I mention the virtual env, it doesn't work anymore. So, going back, so it's a valid example that. because it's demonstrated by the two different error messages. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I didn't run through this talk before I gave it, which is always a bad idea. It's just a but you need perfect to install. Example and it ran the piece installed correctly. Yes. Even though there is no version three, a Python three version. Yes, Py, Py PI has its problems. In in terms of, I've had this problem before that packages have been on Py PI. They've happily installed against my version of Python, even though they don't actually support it, which is annoying. So VM VM is built into Python three. Uh, it's basically like virtual env, but it does symlink your Python binary rather than copying it in. And you run it using uh, just calling the module. There used to be a command that would call it, um, but it broke, so they, they disabled it. So I can Python 3 m the env the env. Uh, of course, on Ubuntu, they choose to split out part of, part of the Python standard library into a separate app package. This is why I created the state, because I wanted to show that you do have to do this with Ubuntu, which is annoying. Uh, so I go in Python, vm, vm, it now creates a folder very similar to the contents of env, except this one has lib64 and has this .cfg rather than, rather than the .json file. Uh, so I can source the env in activate. And now pip goes from the VM. I can still install fish. Fish still won't work. And I can deactivate again. Who in the VM does it symlink Python 5.3? Uh, I can just do LSL. Uh, VM bin. Python yeah. goes to Python 3. Python 3.6 doesn't. There is no symlink for Python 3.6. So that's basically two ways of doing the same thing. So which ones? VM is later, right? VM, v yeah. VM only supports Python 3. Virtual M supports Python 2 as well. So what's, what's the, let's say, recommended? I know neither of these is the currently recommended. But... Uh, virtual env is a lot more popular. Uh, VM gets less traction and is less talked about. And also doesn't integrate uh, with pip env, which we're going to come to. So this is, this is two ways of just managing Python packages against your system Python version. So when you have this, uh, you now you perhaps might want to be able to distribute your application and say what packages you have in your virtual env. So you're, you want to keep your virtual environment clean. You only install things you need for that project. You want to install things when you don't need them anymore. So then you can just run this command pip freeze uh, that gives you a list of all the packages that you've installed. And you can then send that to a file called requirements.txt, which is, that's just a convention. You could call it anything you like, but you want people to understand what it is, so you call it requirements.txt. And then 
you, see, you often see when you download Python projects from GitHub, you'll see this file, and so then you know you just need to do pip install dash r requirements.txt, and it will install all of the requirements that are required by a particular packet, uh, particular yeah project. So I can and it says that I have version one point one of Fish installed. And yeah, it's good to go. So we so far we've been managing packages. You can also manage different installed Python versions. Um, you can do this with this uh, tool called PyEnv. It is available from GitHub and also if you're on Mac and possibly on Linux uh, from Homebrew. Um, it's not written in Python, so it has no bootstrapping problem of getting it working with the system version of Python. It's written entirely in shell scripts. And so then the, the, the command Python is no longer a Python executable. It's a, it's a shim that PyEnv provides that decides based on your environment which version of Python to run. So you can set, you can set your version of preferences at the user level. So you can say user preferences file, even the dot files. There's also uh, each folder can have a different version of Python specified. And it, will, it works kind of like working out if you're in a Git repository, it just traverses your way up the tree until it finds something or finds the root of the file system and gives up. Uh, it also, I haven't said on the slide, but you can also use an environmental variable to say which version of Python you want to use at the moment. And you can also make multiple versions of Python available simultaneously if you want via different uh, executable names. Uh, I'm not going to show you how to use this because I've never used it and I don't want another demo to go wrong live. So let's move on. Also because I only have one version of Python installed on the VM at the moment. So pipenv. Why is pipenv great? So the reason I'm giving this talk is because people wanted to talk about pipenv, but pipenv by itself, you kind of need to know all of the stuff I've talked about so far to see why pipenv is great. Uh, and so pip pipenv takes pip and then shoves virtualenv and pyenv on top of it. So it's based on virtual env. It doesn't use venv, uh, like I was saying earlier. Uh, so it doesn't. So it will work work with Python two as well as Python three. And so now, whenever you were going to make a call to pip, now you make a call to pipenv. And so when you do pipenv install something, it just creates a virtual env. And so by default, it will do this in some location under uh, in your dot files. Um, and then it installs the packages in that. So it, it uses your current working directory, hashes it, and creates a virtual env with, with that name. And uh, then you can get a shell in this virtual env with pipenv dash dash shell. And then rather than storing a database hidden inside the virtual env, it actually outputs this pip file in pipfile.lock to hold the package state of the, of the virtual env. This is really nice because you don't need you don't need to concentrate on creating a virtual environment where to put it, making sure, and it's it's just all abstracted away but under the hood. It, you just say I want to have the environment for this folder, and pipenv does the work for you. So can I install pipenv here? Okay. It's installing pip is just installed pip. Okay. So I can do pip env install fish. So it creates a virtual env, it installs fish. Pip env shell. So now that says okay, I'm running the, I'm running a virtual env with that particular hash. And then if I want to get out of the shell, I think it's still deactivate gets me out of it. So I think you can then specify with pipenv that I want Python 2, but I don't know how to guess. No, no, you have to have it installed for that to work. So I will come back to Python 2. Now a question. Yes. <clears throat> can you specify which shell you want to use? 
can you specify which shell you want to use? I think, I imagine it would inherit the shell that you're using at the moment. Okay. I can create a new shell that changes the yeah, I don't know. Since it very explicitly said running a shell within Bash, um, and exit will actually just oh, exit maybe the environment. It's at least some. So I was just curious. Oh, it's a subshell. Yeah. Oh, it's a, yeah. Um. So if I if I just install subshell, I was wrong. Oh look, that's. Oh, it asks your history. Yeah. Oh. So pipm shell. Shell for unknown virtual environment already activated. No action taken. Ah, you are supposed to exit the subshell. It does create your subshell. That's why. It creates a shell and then sources the virtual and. Yeah. Because if you yeah. like deactivate, it doesn't exit the shell. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, it says use exit to leave from the top. Yeah, yeah. If, 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 if you actually read what it tells you, then it behaves a lot better. <laughs> you can tell I haven't used pipend before. I've used virtual end, but I haven't used pipend, so this is new to me. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about pip env. So pip file. So the difference between pip file and pip file .lock is kind of interesting. Uh, so pip file contains. Actually, we 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 can look here. Because uh, there's a capital P. That's why I wasn't getting it. So uh, pip file. Just has basic things type of questions. I, I, I asked it to install a version of Fish, any version of Fish, and it's done that. And the Python version, okay, I want Python 3.6. Then if we look at pip file .lock, we have in a lot more detail what exactly what was installed. So I had Python version 3.6 with this SHA 256 hash. And then I had fish version 1.1 with exactly this hash. So this this is designed so that you can recreate your exact environment when you deploy to another machine. So you go to another machine, you say, I, w I want to install this pitfile.lock, and it will pull down packages and make sure every package you get matches the version that was installed in your development environment. So you get exactly the same environment to run in production. Whereas if you're just if you if you're just publishing it, uh, Online, then somebody can just install from the pip file, um, and then they they will get the latest versions and hopefully it's the work. And then they can when they go push to production, they can use their pip file .lock for that. So you would in like a repo, you would distribute both pip file and pip file .lock. Uh, depends. If you're targeting multiple Python versions, then you just distribute pip file because pip file .lock will only work with a single Python version at a time. All right. One thing I don't know, I don't know if, you're, if, you're, if you can specify multiple versions. Um, I've never attempted to do that. So you can specify sort of fish while I support versions 1, 3, 3, mm -hmm. 7, I don't know. I've, uh, I've not read that. I, I've no idea. I don't know if you can use, I, th I think it's just as powerful as requirements.txt. So finally, the other the other package manager for Python uh, is called Conda. It's, it was developed by Continuum Analytics for their Anaconda Python distribution. Um, it's not Python specific, especially. It was built for Python, but it can manage almost anything. So it's just a user space package manager. Uh, but you can say, I want to create a, a Conda environment uh, with a particular Python version, with a particular other set of packages, and it creates a folder sitting under the Anaconda, fold, Anaconda folder that will do this. Uh, so then I can activate it. Uh, I, I no longer have to find the path to the activate script because Anaconda has its own activate script that it drops into your path. You can still use pip in this environment, and it installs binaries. So something to point out is that pip installs binaries if there are wheels available, but normally it will, in, um, not normally, but frequently it will need to install from source. Uh, whereas with Anaconda, you're always, I think, going to be installing binaries, which has its up and downsides. If you're on an unsupported architecture, then you can't install things, but you don't have to have a massive toolchain installed to be able to build a C library. 
then you can use source deactivate to deactivate. So now, because I've reset the virtual machine state, I have lost my anaconda. So I need to go and download it again. Um, um, um. Can I ask one quick more question while you're you can. working? Um, so to which extent does like, if um, um, virtual and bun bun mm -hmm. and all of them um, sort of sandbox your Python installation? Say I'm sort of an alpha user and I've installed something through Pip on system level. Yeah. Well, is there a potential conflict with something inside the virtual land? Uh, shouldn't be. Um, because it, your, the Python that you run will look just in the directory tree that Python is to find libraries. I don't think it will then look at system level as well. Is that how Python works? I believe so. Yeah. I, never, I never fully memorized the, um, the Python path, but I think that's how it works. So I can download... I'm going to download Miniconda because it just creates your minimal Conda installation. It doesn't give you all of the packages that come with Anaconda. Uh, so let me get that. This was faster when I was on a wired network. Unfortunately, Conda is not in the System Package Manager, so you can't just install it. I guess that makes sense though, because it has to create a folder in user space to store itself. Is um, is Anaconda just a? It's one of those things that just a blind spot for me about Python. It's mm. not just a another Python distribution. Yeah, it's it contains the current version of Python from Python.org, yeah. and then uh, five hundred megs of packages. Ooh. So it, ha it has NumPy, SciPy. Um, Jupyter, IPython, then Pandas, AstroPy, all of these, all of these really big packages that people want to do science with. Yeah. Okay. Basically, if if you if you never want to install anything from pip, then and you're like a data scientist or something, then it's it, it gives you almost everything you'll probably ever need to use. Yeah, it's a bit dirty. <laughs> So yeah, Anaconda comes with its own, um, it comes with Python 3.6 by default at the moment, but I can exit out of it and I can say conda create dash n, I can say I want Python 2, Python equals 2.7, it will solve what it needs to install to do that, we'll have a quick think about it, it needs those libraries to be able to create. That's an interesting install. It does numbers instead of just, just like the small places for this hash time. <laughs> so now it's created this environment and it's hosted under Miniconda 3 envs Python 2. So we've got some metadata and then all of the files necessary in there. So I can just source activate Python 2. So now when I'm in Python, I get Python 2.7.15. And I can install into this environment with pip. So I can install fish. Fish successfully installs. And it's now visible under miniconda and Python 2. Lib. Oh, it is under here. Yeah. Python site. Yeah, then site packages. There we go. So you can see fish has dumped itself in there. And now because I'm running Python 2, I can import fish. And so I can, I, can, I can test that fish works. Um, actually, now I need to. And it gives you a prog progress file with swimming fish. I was very curious what the fish package was. <laughs> 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 uh, so you can also say bird equals fish dot bird. You prefaced it with all these big physics and astronomy uh, packages that came down and then the fish. <laughs> <laughs> that does not make sense. Yeah. 
Oh, why not? Sure. <laughs> Is it on a train? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. So you, you, you can't reproduce SL with it. Bummer. Oh, yeah, the, the, the reason I found that out was because I was watching a talk on PipEng and the person presenting said, oh yeah, I'm using Fish, so I need to do this. So I immediately went and looked up Fish on PyPI. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's this progress bar thing. They were talking about the, uh, the shell called Fish, which obviously is completely unrelated. Yeah. But, so I, I saw this module, I've got the module stuck in my brain now, so it's just my go-to example. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, that, that, that is... A brief list of why why you should probably try using virtual environments in in your Python, and also how you can get animated um, creatures to be your progress bars. Fantastic! Thank you, Ed.